so far we've um, assumed that prices uh, follow a price norm in our model of Slack. Now what we need to do is um, specify price norms and see how different price norms uh, affect the behavior of the model. And uh, we'll see that actually the model uh, behaves quite differently under different assumptions. Uh, before we go there, it's I think you should take a step back and ask ourselves uh, why is it that uh, we need to specify a price norm in the first place? Because in most macro models, uh, that's not what we do. If you have, say, an RBC model, you'll assume that price is clear market. So you, know, so you do make an assumption about how prices are determined. Uh, but that pins down you know, the price going to be determined from market clearing. If you're in a Dukensian model, um, you know, prices are determined by monopolists uh, who maximize profit. And so here again, you, you do make an assumption about where prices come from, but then, uh, you know, once you uh, resolve the profit maximization problem of firms on the product market or unions on the labor market, you get your prices. Um, so here it's quite different here. Instead of assuming market clearing or assuming, you know, profit maximization and, and you know, uh, pricing power, uh, we're going to assume that there is a price norm. So what, why do we need to do that? Um, and so this is because in the matching model, you have this very um, a unique situation that when a seller and a buyer meet, so in our model, that would be when a customer and a, a seller of a service meet, there's a situation of bilateral monopoly. And uh, so that's really the, that's really what's key to the model. And so bilateral monopoly, what does that mean? It means that both parties, seller and buyer, have some uh, they have some bargaining power. Um, so that's very different from the New Kenyan model, where only one only the sellers have market power, or the Valrasian model, where neither buyers nor sellers have market power. Here, both sides, buyer and seller, have some market power, which means that they can influence prices. <clears throat> and what's the reason for that? Uh, well, the reason why, why, why there is a, a bilateral monopoly situation is that when the buyer and the seller meet, um, both there's a surplus that's created, um, and therefore a surplus that will have to be shared between buyer and seller. So bilateral monopoly occurs because of surplus is created when uh, buyer and seller uh, meet. <clears throat> so um, formally, we, we've established that there is always a surplus when buyer and seller meet. Um, what's the intuition for that surplus? Well, um, it's uh, the intuition is pretty simple. Even if we don't want to go into all the math, which is something that you know we've all, we've already done before, but it's good to have the intuition uh, in mind. So, why is there a surplus? Well, it's very simple actually. You can see that both buyer and seller will have a benefit from a trading, so they'll have an individual surplus, and as, and as a result, once you sum up the individual surplus, you get an even larger aggregate surplus. So, from the uh, buyer's perspective. Uh, the, they've already uh, paid uh, services to be able to match with um, the seller because you know they, they've had to do some, they've had to conduct a visit to the shop of the seller to meet with the seller, and visits are costly. You know that you have to spend a certain amount of services to conduct your visit, and so this cost, this visiting cost, this matching cost is already sunk at the time that the buyer and seller meet. So the, seller, the buyer knows that, well, if, you know, if that doesn't go through, um, you know, they, may have, you know, they may have to use another visit, which is costly to find another uh, 
um, another seller. And so this matching cost are sunk. Um, and therefore, the buyer would, uh, would rather trade with the current sellers and you know, conducting other visits which are costly to, to meet different sellers. Uh, so on the buyer side, uh, the matching cost cost of the visit is sunk at time of match. And therefore, if you're a buyer, you know that you could meet other sellers that would require more visits and more uh, more matching cost, more visiting cost to be expanded. So you'd rather just stick with that seller. Um, now, if you're a seller, well, you know that you're trying to uh, match with buyers, but you know that if that match doesn't go through, then you, this period you won't be able to sell anything. Um, and so you will just be idle the whole period. And so that's, that's costly too. Um, and so if you're, uh, you know, if you're a seller, then you'd rather just trade with the current buyers and just sitting uh, idly uh, on the side. Um, so, so there are no other opportunities. No other opportunities to match if match does not go through. <clears throat> so the seller would remain idle if match breaks down. And that, of course, is costly because that means uh, that the seller would get no income. So here you have a cost of the visit that sunk, and here uh, the seller would remain idle here. And so for these reasons, uh, what we can see is that uh, both buyer and seller um, are better off matching now than separating. And so what that means is that there is a surplus. And as a reason, there's a surplus I mean, there is basically a pie to be split between two parties, and so that's why we're in a bilateral monopoly situation. And what's key with this situation of bilateral monopoly, and that has been known for a very long time, is that you know, there is no like natural solution to how a bilateral monopoly situation should be resolved. Um, and so, you know, if you have a pie to split between two parties, there are infinitely many ways to split the pie. And that's why we need, uh, that's why we need to make an assumption about the price norm, which is a norm that dictates how the pie, the surplus is going to be split. And that's, so this has been this kind of conundrum of how do you resolve bilateral monopoly situation that has been known for a very, very long time, since the 19th century, uh, since at least uh, Edgeworth. So we know that um, pricing assumption must be made to resolve um, situations of bilateral monopoly. And so here, um, the pricing assumption that we make is uh, to assume a certain price norm. And now what we're going to do is look at the evidence on how prices and wages are set, and then we'll try to um, 
make assumptions about the price mills that capture as well as possible what's going on in the real world, how prices and wages are set in the real world. Uh, and then, you know, and then we'll try to, and then we'll see what the implication for the model of these uh, assumptions are. 